Thank you very much. You may be seated. Dean, it's a great privilege tonight to be in the house of God to minister to his sick children. And we are sorry that we do not have uh, the right uh, setting, setting room for you. As we come up the street, there was three or four cars going away, and then we come this way, and there's a line of people going away from the church that they didn't have a room to come in. And maybe by next Sunday, if we'll try hard, maybe we could get the auditorium for the closing night. Down here we could get everybody in. When you have a congested crowd, it, it makes it to a place where it makes the people nervous. And when you get the audience nervous, the Holy Spirit cannot work. You've got to come to God just reverently, quietly, believing, without any interruption, and then the Holy Spirit's much easier for it to deal with it. We certainly had a marvelous time this week here in the church, been speaking on the services and the subjects of Abraham building up faith for tonight for healing service. We've turned this part of the service over for praying for the sick. Now, I would like for uh, everyone to get a real good hold on God's Word first, because healing is God. It's in the atonement. If the old atonement produced healing, this is a much better atonement. Of course, it would have healing in it. And the Bible said he was wounded for our transgressions, and with his stripes we were healed. Now, healing does not lay in a human being. Now, healing is a, is a redemptive blessing of God that has already been purchased for you at Calvary. Salvation is not at all something that takes place tonight. Your salvation was purchased for you 1,900 years ago when Christ died for you at Calvary. Uh, he, there's where your salvation was purchased. Now, you have to accept it for your own personal affair. You say, I'm the sinner, and Christ died for me, and I'm the one he died for, so therefore tonight I come on the basis of the shed blood, and I accept my salvation, knowing there's nothing that I can do within myself, and I'm wholly and fully trusting him tonight and believing that he does save me according to his promise. Then you're saved. No matter if you have a sensation or not a sensation, you're saved by faith in the finished work at Calvary. Now that's the same way you're healed. When you now you say, well, then I wouldn't even have to come to church to be saved. That is true. Anywhere that you meet God's requirements, that's where you're saved. Anywhere that you meet God's requirements, that's where you're healed. Now, God cannot change his opinion on things. We are constantly saying that, that our, we are basing our faith solemnly upon the word of the law. For when God says anything, he cannot take it back. He's God. He's infinite. Every decision is perfect. And now, if he made his decision here and it's perfect, now he cannot make a more perfect decision at another age. He's got to make the same decision because if he did, he would lack what he had in this one. And if he made the wrong decision there, well, then if he made a different decision rather here than he did here, then he made a wrong one here. And if he had done wrong, then he couldn't be God. See? So you must remember when the Lord says anything, that's exactly what it will be. And now, you yourself, now, many times I've seen people grasp at faith and try to reach for it. Many times people just go over the top of it. Faith is so simple. It's just, in the Bible, did you notice what they applied the blood with? was hossip. A hossip is just common weeds. And down in Egypt and also up in the Palestine, you find it growing around in the cracks of the dobies and so forth, right out on the ground. Just a little green, three-quarter shaped, diamond-shaped leaf with a little flower on it. You could just pick it up anywhere. It was hossip. That's what they applied the blood on the lintel of the door. Hossip. And the reason they made it weeds because it represents faith. How do you apply the blood? By faith. Not some super something. 
but just common faith like you have. That's why you apply the blood. Like you say, I'm going out to get my car and go home. How do you know you are? You're not sure of that. You're almost sure of it, but you believe you are. Then you just go ahead, acting, and you go on. That's the same way healing is. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept him as your healer upon the basis of his shed blood, that he was wounded for your transgressions. With his stripes you were healed. Not will be healed, but were past him. You've already been healed by his stripes. I think that's the most marvelous thing. By his stripes we were in past him healed. Now, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Tommy Osborne, Mr. A. Allen, also many of the brethren on the field that has a ministry of laying on hands on the sick and praying for them. And that's where I get to fall back. You don't pray for enough. Now, those Christian brothers, I believe that they have a ministry from God. And now, uh, they pray for hundreds and hundreds of nights. Now, that's perhaps, and I do believe with all my heart, that they're doing what God told them to do. That's their ministry. Now, but if you'll just bear with me a moment, I believe there is a higher way to reach Christ than laying on hands. Because if you notice, the patient can say this, Brother so-and-so laid hands on me. I felt the power of God coming through his hands. See, that puts a man in it again. But that was a Jewish tradition. If you notice, the little priest said, Come lay your hands on my daughter. That's right. And she will be well. Now, that, he was a Jew. But the Roman, the Gentile, said, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. Just speak the word. And my servant will live. You see where that Roman's faith, it placed Jesus. He went ahead to say, I'm a man under authority. He was a centurion, which means he's under a, a century, a hundred man. In the Roman army, he said, when I say to this one, go, he goes. This one, come, he comes. He knew that everything was under his jurisdiction. He had control of and it had to obey. What did he say then when he confessed Christ to that? Say to my, he said this. You are, you have power over anything, over any sickness. Just speak the word. And what did Jesus say about that? He turned around. And he, he certainly did honor that Roman. He said, I have not seen faith like that in Israel. See, don't come lay your hands on, just speak the word. Now that's where we're trying to get the people. To believe that he is not some human being, it's your Lord, Jesus Christ. It's what he did for you. Now, the great thing that seems to happen today to the people, that they try to think that we serve some sort of a historical God, or he was a great healer in one day, or he was a great one in one day, but today it's a memory, a historical affair. That's wrong. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he lives. If he's still alive, and if he still lives, he has to be the same in nature, the same in power, the same in attitude. He's the same Jesus, Hebrews 13, 8, same yesterday, today, and forever. If there was any way that I could, well, then I'm not a doctor. I know nothing about medicine or operations. Uh, I honor and believe in medicine and operations. I believe there are God-sent blessings to us. But sometimes we get to a place where it's beyond what our medical science can, can handle. Then when it comes to that, I think, instead of giving up and dying, we have a right to come to the great physician. If your local doctor couldn't help you, you'd have a right to go to a specialist. And if the specialist can't help you, then let's go to the specialist of specialists, Jesus. That's why I'm here. Not to take the doctor's patient. But to pray for the doctor's patient, God's child, and my friend. That's why I'm here. Now, medicine does not heal. We all know that. There's no medicine that claims to heal. Doctors don't claim that. Medicine is an aid to nature. God is the healer. There's never been anyone healed by medicine. You can't do it. Healing is a building of tissue, and there's nothing that will build tissue but life. Develop tissue. Now, we can have great do things greatly by setting a bone. Well, now, 
That don't heal the bone. It just places it back so God heals it. Something has to produce the calcium and so forth to heal that bone. Now, the doctor, it's your, it's your, what you should do is go to the doctor and have him set it. But if God doesn't heal it, it'll never be healed. If you've got a bad tooth, the doctor can pull it. But he cannot heal the socket and the tissue that he tore out. He might remove an appendix or a, a growth in your side or something. But he cannot heal the place where it come out of. He can remove, but cannot heal. Medicine doesn't heal. No medicine heals. Uh, it just simply keeps clean while God heals. And we must keep that in mind. And now, tonight as we approach him for healing, now, I'd like to ask this one thing. If How many people in here would raise your hand to this, that you believe that the Scripture states in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Thank you. And if you believe that, if the Scripture says that, then you must remember what the Scripture says is the truth. Now, Jesus said when he was here on earth that he did not do any of the works himself. We are all aware of that. He said, It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. That is true, isn't it? And in John 5, 19, he was questioned about passing through a pool where his Thousands of people, lame, blind, halt, and withered, and he found a man laying on a pallet, and he knew he'd been in that condition for 38 years, and he made him whole and walked away and left that multitude of people laying there. And he was questioned. I suppose if he was in a physical body walking among us tonight, would do the same thing, he'd be questioned again by our authority. And he said these words, now mark it in your heart, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Now, how many knows that scriptural truth? Then Jesus never performed any miracles until God showed him by a vision what to do first. If it's not so, then he told something it wasn't so, and that makes the scriptures wrong, then where are we at? He never done it just at random. No prophet never did it at random. They only did as God told them and showed them what to do. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he declared himself to be the Messiah, and John Clare declared there was a Messiah sign upon him, and the Old Testament claimed there'd be a Messiah sign, and he proved that Messiah sign to the people that he was the Messiah. How they know it was by he was a God prophet. Moses, the one that they had followed, said, The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. We know that. We're aware of that. And amongst the Jews and, and the Samaritans, he showed this sign. But of course, he never amongst the Gentiles because we were heathens in those days. Uh, our people, the Gentiles, Romans. We wasn't looking for no Messiah. And Messiah only appears to those who's looking for him. That's the way those who wait for him, he will appear the second time. So it would behoove us tonight to be waiting for him and watching for him, that we do not miss it when he comes. Amen. Now, Jesus before going away, I'm quoting these scriptures before I my message, Jesus before leaving the earth, he said, a little while and the world will see me no more. Now, the world there is the word cosmos, which means the world are, see, the world will see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, that's the church, for I will be with you, even in you, unto the end of the world. Now, we all know the scripture says that. Now, then that makes Jesus the same yesterday and forever. Now watch, the works that I do shall you do also. And more, I know the King James says greater, but if you get the emphatic diagnosis, no one could do any greater. He raised the dead, stopped nature. More, because then God was in one man, Christ Jesus. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in him, the scripture says. First Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. For God was manifested in the flesh. He was called Emmanuel. He was only in one man. But he... When he, this one man, being the Son of God, gave his life to sanctify his church that he might return in the form of the Holy Ghost and be in his church universally. 
The works that I do shall you do also, same kind, more than this shall you do, for I go to my Father. So that he could return back in the form of the Holy Ghost and be in his church universal. It's to my confession tonight that Jesus Christ is alive and not dead. He lives in his church. Although many of our creeds has forced him on the outside as the Bible, we see in the Lady of Sin Church Age, the last church age, which is the Pentecostal age that we're in now, Jesus was standing put out of his church, knocking on the door, trying to get back in. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase him. Try it. If any man will open, I'll come in and sup with him. Now, upon this, upon this confession, that if we can see tonight in this building that Jesus is still alive and can prove beyond a shadow of doubt that Jesus Christ, God's Son, in the form of the Holy Spirit, is right in this building. Then if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he'll act the same as he did yesterday, today, and forever. His compassions and love will be the same. And it was based upon the basis of, if ye can believe, I can. I do as the Father shows me. Like the woman touched his garment, virtue went out. He looked around over the audience till he found the woman had touched him. He said, told her of her blood issue and stopped because that her faith had saved her. You notice that word saved? Run that through the Bible and see if it ain't the same Greek word each time, sozo. Means saved physically or saved spiritually. Either one works, translated the same thing both times in the Greek. Sozo. Thy faith hath saved thee. Saved thee from what? Sin. Saved thee from what? The blood issue. Thy faith has saved thee. And it's all based upon faith. Now we find that when Jesus was here and he showed that himself he was Messiah, there was many of them that did not believe it. And they wanted to class him as a fortune teller, a Beelzebub, a devil that was doing the work of God. Any of you remember that in the Bible? All right. Jesus said, I forgive you for that. But when the Holy Ghost has come to do the same thing, to speak against it will never be forgiven in this world, neither in the world that is to come. And he promised the Gentile age. At the close of the Gentile age, it would be the same kind of a Messiah sign as the Jewish age is closing, as the Samaritan age is closing, the three classes of people, Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people. And at the end of the Gentile age, if that's the way he proved himself to be Messiah to the close of the, Je- to the, close of the Jews and the close of the Samaritans, then he's got to act the same way to the Gentiles. Yes. If we go through just on theology, then he misrepresented himself by proving himself Messiah to them the way he did it and let us not have that same sign. But if you'll bear closely now, Listen to you in these chairs and stretches. If you'll watch closely now. Now, he can only prove himself to be alive, but as far as your healing, it's a finished product. If he was standing here tonight with this suit on that he gave me, he could not heal you. If you come and begged him and pleaded him to, he cannot do what he's already done. He's left it up to you on the basis of your faith. He cannot save you against your own way, your own will. You're a free moral agent. You can turn it down or you can accept it. You understand clearly now? He cannot heal you against your will. He cannot save you against your will. But he can make himself known in his promises. Then you accept it up on those bases. How many understands it now? Now let us bow our heads then as we pray. Most gracious and holy Father, who brought again from the dead our blessed Lord, and has presented him to us as a high priest, ever living to make intercessions upon our confession of what he has done for us. Sitting tonight at the throne of God, the right hand of the majesty, a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. We are approaching thy holiness tonight, Lord, and thy throne of grace through his all-sufficient name that he gave to us Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, Heavenly Father, there are many who have been waiting this week, sitting in the building under anticipation, waiting for this night to come. They say that hundreds have been turned from the building. Father God, 
I pray that you will make yourself so clear to these people that there will not be one feeble person in our midst. O oh, great Holy Spirit, seeing the hour that we are living, the shadows are falling, the end is at hand. And God, I pray that you'll let him circumcise every heart, take away every unbelief and every shadow of doubt. And we pray that he'll manifest himself so vividly among us tonight that there will not be one person, young or old, but what will see that he is here. And may they embrace him as their Savior and as their healer. May the unsaved be saved. And may the sick be healed. And those who are shedding, setting in the regions of the shadows of death, may great light spring upon them. Yes. May they rise and go home and be well. Hallelujah. That the glory of God might be known on the West Coast. That it might be said to their children and their loved ones and them around about that Jesus still lives. Now, Father, we are taught in the Bible that one day, a day after the resurrection, or the same day, that there was one of his disciples, whose name was Theophius, and he and his friend was walking to a city called Emmaus, disgusted and was going back. There's many tonight in that condition that thinks that the church has failed, and it has, but thou has not failed. And on the road, there come one stepping out from the side of the road and begin to speak to them and explain the scriptures to them when he asked their sadness and their defeat. He made as if he'd pass on by, but they constrained him to come in. When he got him inside and closed the door, then he did something just like he did before his crucifixion. And immediately they knew it was him. He vanished out of their sight with some back door somewhere. Light-hearted and light-footed, they ran quickly back to Jerusalem, telling the people that truly Jesus was still alive. And they spoke among themselves and said, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? Father, I pray that you'll let him step out from these aisles tonight in their ever heart. Talk to him, us in the next few minutes. And then show himself. May he stand on this platform among us tonight. And show himself that he's the same Jesus. Then may the sick rush home quickly. Saying, did not our hearts burn within us as the word went forth? It was strange, but something was talking to me all the time. Grant it, Father. And we'll praise thee for it as long as we live. And always remember it because we're sincerely asking it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, for just a few minutes, I would just like to call your attention to St. Matthew 14, 27. But straightway, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of a good courage. It is I... Be not afraid. Must have been about the time the sun was going down. It had been a terrible day. There's thousands of people had gathered around. But the big fisherman with his big brawny back and muscles was shoving the little boat off of the sandy banks of the lake. They were going over, commanded by their Lord. The cross over to the other side while he sent the people away. And if Simon, perhaps the largest one among them, pushed the little boat off the shore, climbed in up among the rest of the apostles and sat down about the middle of the ship and took his oar in his hand, and as they perhaps pulled two or three times then way to the congregation they were leaving on the bank. And then crying, some of them, come back and see us again. We would love to be going with you because they had won their hearts and they loved these men. They had seen the hand of God moving with them and they know that they were servants of God. 
The sun was getting red as it passed over the uh, Galilean mountain, and the streets was settled in the sky and it began to turn dark. When I guess the oars let up just a little bit, and I believe it must have been the young John. He was the youngest among them, probably a man in his thirties. And when they stopped to rest just a little bit because the craft was made of heavy wood and great huge oars, and it was heavy and one man on a big oar and it was hard, probably in the still of the evening the winds had settled and there wasn't a ripple on the lake. And they pulled pretty hard. John must have pulled the oar in and said, Brethren, that's breaking on their conversation. He might have said something like this, We can rest assured that we're not following some sort of a deceiver. You know, I remember when I was a little boy, he might have said, I remember my mother taking the scrolls of the Bible, and she used to sit and tell me the stories of our people when they come to this land that God gave them. And what a great time they had coming. How they come up out of Egypt and Jehovah fed them in the wilderness for 40 years. And I used to say, Mama, how did they ever get anything to eat in the wilderness? And I remember my pretty little Jewish mother used to say, John, my darling, God rained their bread down out of heaven every night. And I would say to her like this, Mommy, where did God get such big ovens to make the bread? Well, you see, darling, God is a creator. He doesn't have to have ovens. He just speaks, and he creates his word, is creative. Brethren, today when I stood on that rock behind him, and he seen him taking those five little biscuits and two fish and broke that bread and fed five thousand. I know he was something to do with that Jehovah who could create. You see, brethren, if he is who we believe he is and we know he is the Son of God, then his works will be like God. For he said, if I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. So that settled it forever for me. For I know that the Bible said that that's the way that Jehovah created bread. And brethren, he didn't cook it. He didn't bake it. He didn't go up the sea to catch fish. Or neither did he cook the fish. He just broke off a piece of cooked fish. And when he reached back, there was another piece of fish already cooked. I want to ask this audience something. What kind of an Adam did he turn loose there? He never growed wheat and made bread. He just took the biscuit or the little loaf and he tore it in two and handed it over to Simon. And when he looked back to get Andrew a piece, another one's grown on. I watched him do that 5,000 or more times. To me, he's Jehovah. He's a creator. I just wish that my mother could have lived to see that or been here today to watch that. How I would like to went and got her and put my arms around her and said, Mother, that is that Jehovah that you talked about. For he's the creator. His children was hungry, just like they were hungry in the wilderness. And he provided bread out of the heavens and fed two and a half million people. And here today, standing on earth, Living in the form of his own son, the Lord Jesus, our Savior, I've seen him with the power of his father break the bread and hand it out. The same creative power. Therefore, I know that he is truly the son of God. I believe it. Simon, sitting not across from him on the other side of the ship, Pushing back the perspiration off his brow, he said, Brethren, I'd like to give my testimony. You know, there's something about it when Christians get together and they start testifying, there's just no end to it. They just keep on. One's got to have something to say. 
because he's so good to us. So we just want to express it some way. And we never find a place to stop. He's so good. I'm in the great brawny fisherman. I can imagine him giving his testimony. He said, oh, my brother Andrew sitting right there ahead of me. I remember him telling me that he had met some sort of a prophet. And he come and got me to go to the meeting one day, and I remembered what my father told me. And you, brother, know that my father was a Pharisee. And I stayed with our denomination, our because I was a Pharisee too. He's a Pharisee. And he said, you know what happened? I remember hearing my father before he left the earth when he was getting old, his hair was gray one day. He set me down on the side of the ship and he said, Simon, my little son, that he has always believed that I'd live to see the day to see the Messiah. But I don't know whether I will now or not. I may be summoned any time to answer. But Simon, I, my father passed this information to me and I'm passing on to you. Now, in the day of the true Messiah, there will be a lot of things raised up, Simon, that's falsely. And we know the Bible said it happened. Always does. But, Simon, don't you be deceived, son, if it comes in your day. Now, Simon, you'll have to stay straight with the Scriptures to know him. Don't take what someone else says about it. Stay with the Scriptures, Simon. Now, the Bible says our prophet Moses told us that the Lord our God should raise up a prophet likened unto him. Now, Simon, this Messiah will be a prophet. And the, the sign that he'll give that he is a prophet, that, he'll, that he is the Messiah, it'll be a prophet's sign. And, Simon, you know that we always believe our prophets. Because when our prophets speak and what he says comes to pass, then God told us to hear that prophet. I'm with him. But if he speaks and it doesn't come to pass, then don't fear that prophet. But if it does come to pass, now, it's been 400 years, Simon, since our last prophet. We know that next prophet to arise is going to be Messiah. And you watch for him. He'll do the sign of the prophet. And when I went down one day on the lake after standing all night and was discouraged, Andrew told me, my brother, sitting ahead of me here, that he was going to be on a certain place. And we was bringing our boats in. I've seen all the women and men gathering from the little huts along the lakeside. I wonder what it was all about. And Andrew said, Simon, you must come with me today. For the Messiah is going to speak today, down here. Well, he said, now, I did not believe that that could be any Messiah. But I remember what Daddy told me. And when I walked up into his presence, when I heard him speaking before I got there, there was something different about him. He seemed to be a man who knew what he was talking about. He wasn't talking like a scribe. He was talking like a man who knew what he was speaking of. And he turned his head to see me coming. And as soon as he seen me, he looked me in the face and said, Your name is Simon. You are the son of Jonas. Brethren, that settled it forever for me. Not only did he know me, he knew that godly old father of mine that told me to look for this sign. Therefore, I know that was the Messiah because it was the sign the Father said the Bible said would be following and making him the Messiah. Therefore, I know he was Messiah. It must have been then Philip setting back towards the stern of the boat, turned around, put his arm around Nathaniel and said, Nathaniel, shall I testify or shall you? Oh, Nathaniel, being always a polite gentleman, he said, go ahead and testify uh, about it, uh, Philip. Well, he said, when I seen that happen to Simon, I was positive that that was the Messiah because he was showing the sign of the Messiah. So therefore, I know that my good old friend here, Philip, was, or Nathaniel, was a great Bible scholar. He'd read up on the Bible. He knew what the Messiah would be. 
So I took around the mountain 15 miles. So I come to Philip's house, and, or Nathaniel's house, rather, and I knocked on the door. His wife told me he was back in the orchard. I went back there, and I found him on his knees, praying, Oh, God of Israel. That's when something happens when you go to praying. Send unto us deliverance. And I stood back and in my heart, I thanked God that I had the message for him. That God had used me to come around the mountain to my friend. And when he got up and dusted his clothes, I said, Nathaniel, and he said, Philip, I'm glad to see you. Quickly, I told him, come see who we have found. There's something about it. Whenever you come in contact with the real Messiah, Jesus Christ, God's Son, you can't keep it yes, still. Amen. You've got to tell somebody. It just spreads it, thrills your heart. You can never be the same. Come see who we have found. Jesus of Nazareth, he's the Messiah, the son of Joseph. And you know, Nathaniel being such a scholar, and he was such a true Pharisee, until he said, now wait a minute, now wait a minute. Now, Philip, surely you haven't went off on some tantrum or some deep end. Now, you know, if the Messiah had come, he would come down to our organization. He would make himself known to us. He'd go to Caiaphas as a high priest. He would never be born in Nazareth. He'd never deal with that bunch of holy rollers or so forth down there. You know, if he's coming, he'd come to our church. Of course, we are the Pharisees. But, you know, that attitude has never left the people. And God has never changed either. He does what he wants to do. He does what he said he would do. He comes, he don't have to come to any organization. He just comes to the people. So we find out. He said, well, now you come and see. He said, now, now look here, Philip. I believe you are a good scholar. And I don't see how you'd ever fall for such a thing as that. And I said to him, I want to ask you something. Do you not know the Holy Scriptures? Yes, I've studied them since a child. All right, tell me then. Tell me then if you know the Scriptures. What is Messiah going to be like when he comes? Why, you'll be born of a virgin. And what kind of a life will he lead? What kind of a sign will he give us? You know, we're Jews, we seek signs. God told us to watch the prophet and see what he said. If it come to pass, he was God's prophet. What kind of a sign will Messiah be? Well, according to the scriptures, he'll be a prophet. Now, I want to ask you something. You remember that old fisherman that you bought that fish from that day and he couldn't sign your receipt? Yes. Oh, his name was Simon. Yeah, I used to know his old father up here at the, at the synagogue. Well, as soon as he walked up into the presence of this Jesus of Nazareth, he looked him straight in the face and told him what his name was. And told him whose son he was. Hallelujah. What wouldn't surprise me, Nathaniel, when you walk up in front of him, he don't tell you who you are. Oh, he said, now, could there be any good thing like that come out of Nazareth? Well, I think he'd give him a good answer. I answered ought to satisfy everybody. He said, come see. Yes. Yes. Don't sit at home and criticize it. Come find out. Yes. Come see for yourself. Yes. You ought to be that much concerned. Come see, examine it by the scriptures. See what it'll be. And as they went along the mountain talk, and soon they came up into the place where Jesus was. Praying for the sick, maybe he's in the prayer line, or maybe we just stood in the audience. But as soon as he come up, Jesus looked over and caught him. You know, there's something about that scripture, my sheep know my voice. He caught his eyes, and he said, Behold an Israelite, and whom there is no guile. I said that one time, and a man said, Sure, he's dressed like an Israelite. No, they all dressed alike. Arabs. The Jews, the Greeks, they all dressed alike, the Eastern garb. said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. That took the wind out of his sails. Watch what Nathaniel said. Rabbi, which means teacher, master. Rabbi, 
This is the first time you ever saw me. This is the first time I ever laid eyes on you. How did you ever know me? Jesus said before Philip called you when he was on the tree, I saw you. That did it. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the King of Israel. If that was Jesus yesterday, and he's the same today, that's Jesus today. You believe it? Sure. Now, we could just go on and on through the Scriptures, but I'm trying to hold my time so you won't be wore out in many... I want to hit one more Scripture, if possible, before... We come to the prayer line. Let's just take one more thing. After Philip got through testifying, Andrew, they maybe started the boat up. He said, just a minute, brethren. Let me testify. You know, there's something like that. You always want to testify when you really come in contact with Jesus. He said, let me testify for all of us. So we'll all know. He said, you remember that time that he told us that morning or the day before? Tomorrow we are going down to Jericho. And now from Jerusalem to Jericho is right down the mountain. You go right over and right down the mountain to Jericho. But he had need to go by Samaria. And we often wonder why did he want to go all the way up to Samaria before going down to Jericho? And he said he had need of going. Why the Father is sending him. And you remember we got there about noon and he was so tired and we were upset about him. And he sat down by the side of the little public well, about a little panoramic there with the... Said he sat down there to get... We thought he'd take a drink, and there was no, nothing there to drink out of. So we, he sent us in the city to buy vittle, food. And you remember all day when we got finished and started back out? When we was coming up, we happened to hear something at the well. And we slipped up behind the bushes, and we looked over to see what it was. There was a woman of ill fame coming up to the well, and we listened in. Now, I'm going to quote, brethren, and you all remember this. I can hear Andrew say, You remember the woman let the window down to get some water? And when she brought the water up, we heard, looked over and seen what he was going to say about this woman, ill fame. She was uh, out of the churches. She was an outsider. By the way, she was a Samaritan. Great segregation. The Samaritans and Jews didn't deal with each other. And we seen this woman, a lovely looking woman, but we knew she was ill-famed the way she was dressed. And they brought the water up and we heard him say, Give me a drink, woman. Bring me a drink. And you remember how astonished we was that our Lord would have any kind of dealings with a woman like that? And so the woman said, Sir, it's not customary for you to ask me, a Samaritan woman, for any favor because you are a Jew. And you remember what he said? If you only knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. Not give you waters that you don't have to come here to draw. And she said, The well is deep and you have nothing to draw with. And you remember, brethren, how the conversation went on about the Jew and the Samaritan? Now, I believe, I say this, I believe that Jesus was trying to contact her spirit, talking to her. The Father sent him up there. Let me clear that in your mind. Keep everything you've said in your mind now. now. I want to clear this. The Father, he said, I do nothing till the Father shows me. And the father must have set him up there and said, go up till you find this well. He'd never been there before. Sit down there and wait. I'm sending you there and rest that will take care when you get there. Well, he's seen this woman and that must have been the one. So he began to talk to her to find her spirit. Now, I remember Jesus could perceive the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And does not our Bible tell us, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the sonder and the mire of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart and mind. Amen. The Word of God. Jesus was that Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There was the Word of God piercing into that woman's soul, finding where her trouble was. How many in my class tonight knows what her trouble was? Raise up your hand. Sure. She had five husbands. So he said, go get your husband and come here. Why, she said, I have no husband. And Andrew said, brother, you remember what we thought? Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh. He's made a mistake this time. He's sure wrong there on this Samaritan. It might work on Jews, but I don't know about Samaritans. (laughs) He's sure made a mistake now. Oh, she says herself, she doesn't have any husband. Now, if you'll just remember, the same thing happened to a Jew, too, one time. When the angel of God went out in human flesh at Sodom and Gomorrah, there was one of the queens of the Jewish women, Sarah. A modern Billy Graham and old Roberts goes down into the city of Sodom and preached the gospel. But there was one of them stayed back talking to the elect church. He never went down to the church in Sodom. He come to the called out, the elected church. Abraham had just been through it. And while he was talking to Abraham, now he was a stranger. And he said, Abraham, and remember, they were called him Abram. Just a few days before that, his name had been changed from Abram to Abraham. He said, Abraham, where is Sarah? Not Sarah. Sarah, her prince name, just been given her a few days before. Where is Sarah, thy wife? How did he know he was married? How did he know he had a wife? And how did he know her name was Sarah? And Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. He said, I'm going to visit you. I'm going to bring it to pass. You've waited 25 years for this baby. I'm going to visit you according to the time of life fire. And Sarah, in the tent, behind him, laughed within herself and thought in her heart, me, an old woman, nearly a hundred years old, can have pleasure with my Lord again, my husband. Me, an old woman, a hundred, and him around a hundred years old, could I ever have pleasure again with him? It just can't be so. And the angel... The man that was a human being eating flesh, drinking milk, and eating cornbread. And Abraham said it was God. He said, why did Sarah laugh in the tent, saying within herself, how could this be? (laughs) She doubted. I remember Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. If that same spirit that was represented in human flesh that Abraham called Elohim. Anybody know what Elohim means? Sure, the Almighty, the self-existing one. Abraham, the patriarch, called him Elohim. He represented himself in a body of flesh, eating and drinking, and just like any other human being. And he'd done that sign to the elected church before he destroyed Sodom. Yeah. Oh, don't miss it, brethren. Yeah. That hour has arrived. Yeah. Elohim. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever. While his body is sitting at the right hand to make intercession for his church. That same spirit dwelling in his people. God manifested in the form of the Holy Ghost. And his people are doing the same thing. You see it? To the Gentiles. We've had 2,000 years since we've had it. But he said it would be in the evening time. The prophet said it shall be light in the evening time. There will be a day that won't be called night or day. Now the S-U-N rises in the east and sets in the west. And the S-O-N, like the S-U-N of God... This is the S-O-N of God. He came first to the east. We've had a dismal day. We've had enough to join church and make an organization and bring some people in, put your names on books and get forgiveness of your sins. But the prophet said, in the evening time, it shall be light. We're right here at the west coast. We're less than a half a mile from the waters. If we go across, we're back east again. That's the reason sin's abounding. The waves are swept up and she's just contaminated. But he said, it shall be light in the evening time. 
Now he's dealing with the Samaritan woman. And the brethren in the boat said, you know what? We all thought that he had been caught in a trap. We wonder what he'll do now. She denied it. She said, I have no husband. But listen to what he said. I can hear Andrew say, but brother, and you remember what he said? He said, thou hast said true. You've got five husbands. And the one you're now living with is not your husband. You said, well. Now we thought this Samaritan woman, being an evil character, that she'd say, like the well-trained preachers did, say, well, you must be Beelzebub. She know more about God than a lot of ministers does today. She said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now listen to her word. Read it, St. John 4. I perceive that thou art a prophet. We, we Samaritans, we know the Messiah's coming, and the Messiah will tell us these things. That's going to be the sign of the Messiah. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. And she ran into the city and said, Come see a man who's told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? Isn't that the sign that the Messiah was supposed to show? And the Bible said, The man of Samaria believed on him because what the woman told them that he done. Was that Jesus yesterday? That'd be Jesus today if he's the same Messiah. Much more we could go to we have in time. About that time, they put the oars back in the water. Pulled a few times. You know, all the time they were testifying, they were pretty quiet. But about time they quit testifying, about like time when the church quit testifying, giving God praise and glory, Satan must have looked up over the hill. He said, oh, now I got them just where I want them. They've went off without him. I'm afraid that's what the church has done today. You got so interested in whether you've gone to the four square or the assembly or the oneness or the twoness or whatever it is. You're so interested that you're not going to build a building a little bigger than the other or you're not going to do something a little bigger, have a bigger Cadillac or something better than the rest of them. I think on our big programs and our society, we've went off without him. Satan saw it. And he began to blow with his poison breath, kicking up the waters, said, I'll drown him. Oh, yes, he's blowing with his poison breath right into the Pentecostal church. I know many Pentecostal people who don't give up the thoughts of divine healing. Sure, they don't believe it. I went to a Pentecostal church not long ago to have some seats. Uh, we had an army and thousands were standing outside. I went down and asked this Pentecostal brother, he had about 500 seats, I said, could I rent them from you, brother? He said, you're holding that healing service? I said, yes, sir. He said, I wouldn't let a person sit on my seat that believes in divine healing. <laughs> there you are. That's Pentecost. Don't you laugh at the Baptist. It's poison breath. You went off too much on denominational ends. Went off on big things. Trying to fashion after Hollywood. Trying to do things like they do here on the West Coast or any other coast. Trying to fashion after the world. He saw you without it. Hatched out of a bunch of school somewhere, a bunch of incubator preachers. That's right. I always felt sorry for an incubator chicken. It did chirp, chirp, and didn't have any mammy. <laughs> That's why we turn out preachers today by degrees of psychology. Our great famous Pentecostal movement. Now, before a missionary can go overseas, a great movement of Pentecost, they have to go before a psychiatrist to see if their intellect is right. You're a backslid when you get that. Right? Who is our intellect? It's the Holy Ghost. Jesus. But we have that. We take them before doctors, psychiatrists, men of the world, to find out if their intellectual is powerful enough to be a missionary. Oh, oh my, the poison winds are sure blowing. It's got the church to a place. You can't tell Pentecostal people no more from anyone else. They're all looked just about alike. Go around our women wearing bad ill clothes and our... A lot of our brethren go out there and you see them stand on the street telling jokes and mm, drunken sailors wouldn't tell. You see them down there, two or three different wives living in the church and making them deacons and everything else. And go out and act just like the world. You don't hear the old-fashioned prayer meetings no more and the calling out on God that's all forgotten, it's all past, you see. I'm afraid we went off without him, don't you think so? 
We had a war and a lot of money flowed in and money began to flow from everywhere. And I think we went off after big buildings and big denominations and big things and we left him alone. That's right. Then it come to a place where all hopes is gone. You're just about to sink. Wish I could linger on this a little while, but I promise not. They're beating around in them waves. They were just about gone. But you know, I got this comfort to tell you. He had left too far. You know what he done? He knew that was coming to pass. He knew they was going to get in that condition, and then he knew Jews going to get in that condition. Sure. What did he do? So that he could watch them, he climbed the highest mountain there was in the country. Higher up, you go farther than you can see. And he climbed up the top of the mountain, and he had been up there on top of the mountain watching them out there rolling. Up. Wish I could sing. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Don't you know that? He sees your toils and troubles. He sees how sick you are. He can be touched by the feeling of your infirmities. Not only did he climb a mountain, but he climbed Calvary. And he climbed on above the moon and stars until he sets on the throne of God so you can see the universe. Yeah. He's watching. He's waiting. Just in the midnight hour when all hopes is gone, the little boat was pitched about like a bottle stopper out there. When 10,000 devils of the sea had swore they'd drown them disciples that night because they'd gone off without them. That's what Satan says today. I've got that Pentecostal bunch. I'm rocking them. They're fussing at one another. There's no agreement with them. They're just like the world. I'm rocking them back and forth as hard as they can. I shouldn't shake them down to a cold formal bunch. But right in that great hour, here he come walking to them on the sea. Brother, sister, Listen to closing. The same thing is happening now that happened then. The only thing that could help them and get them back to safety, they was afraid of it. It looked spooky to them. They thought it was a spirit. And today, when Christ comes walking to us with his Messiah power, with his Messiah signs, just as he said, we say, it's a telepathy or perhaps maybe a fortune teller. Maybe it's this, that, or then I don't know that the Scriptures made the promise. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he could speak tonight, he'd say to your hearts to comfort you here that say, Do not fear. It is I. Be not afraid. Here is his word that gives a promise. Here's what he said he promised. I believe that he's here now. Do you believe the same with me? What? Oh, people, listen to me just a minute. What if he come walking in among us tonight and would prove himself that he's the Messiah? Would you be afraid to say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my healer. I'm not afraid. The doctor said my hours is gone. It's the midnight. I got cancer. I, I got heart trouble. I'm dying. I'm crippled. He said I'll never walk. But I'm not afraid of you. You'd hear him say, he's not afraid, it's I, I promised I'd do this, as it was the day you could say in a lifetime, Thou art our God, and we love you, and you're for everlasting to everlasting God. I pray thee, Father, that thou will help us tonight. Now, if you just walk in among us tonight, Father, after this little cut-up message, to let the people see by the Bible what you were and what your promises are. You represented yourself and proved yourself, and that was the sign that you proved to them that you was the Messiah to both Samaritan and Jew. But you never did that before the Gentiles not one time. But you promised you'd do it in the last days, just not like it was in Noah, but as in Sodom before the fire. That's when you did it. That's when you did the sign to Abraham, the called-out church. I pray now, Father, that I believe with all my heart that the people of your church is called out of every organization, every denomination, Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, whatever more. They are the church because they have been born into the mystical body of Christ. Many of them are represented here tonight, Father. 
I pray that you'll grant the blessings that we're asking. I'm not sufficient, Lord. There's no more I can say. I can only quote your word. Just quote it to the people the way it's written. And tell them, now it's up to you to testify of whether I've told the truth or not. I pray that you will do it. That every person in here might embrace you and say, come into my little ship, Lord. And as soon as they entered the ship, the Bible said, uh, and immediately they were at the shore. Oh God, it won't take but just a little bit to get them well, to be healed or to be saved. When they will invite you and you get inside of them, in their little bark while they're sailing, life's solemn main. Many of you are no doubt tonight, Lord, but what the waves of sickness, cancer, TB, heart trouble is baffling to them. They're about to go down. All hopes is gone. But they may not be afraid tonight, Lord, for we can hear that comforting voice through thy word, saying, It is I. Give a good cheer. Be not afraid. We'll be listening for you now, Father. This is your word. You promised it. Ah, we are your servants. I cannot do this with the anointing that you might give me. You'll have to anoint them too to believe it, Father. For when you went to your own country, many mighty works you cannot do because of unbelief. That's when you said a prophet's not without honor except him in his own community, his own, his own county or country. And I pray, Lord, that you'll honor your word tonight and make it live anew before these people. Father, look at them. They're sick. They're needy. They're laying in this hot room. Hundreds of them turned away and they're standing till their limbs are cramping and hurting. God, let Satan move out of this place now. Let true faith of God come moving in. May they understand why we ask it in Jesus' name as we commit ourselves in this audience to you. Amen. Just listen to that song. Only believe. I can see uh, the apostles. Ten days before, they've been given power to cast out devils, heal the sick. And here you are with an epileptic boy defeated. They were probably screaming and stomping and pouring all in the heart. Come out, you devil. That devil just laid right there. So just coming down the hill come the Son of Man, the Son of God. When Satan knew that, he knew he wasn't meeting those apostles. The Father said, Lord, have mercy on my John is fiercely vexed with the devil. All times he falls in the fire and into the water to destroy him. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't heal him. Well, why couldn't they heal him? Not because they didn't have power, because they didn't believe. That's tonight. If you go out of your sick, it's not because God hasn't got the power. and given it to you because you don't believe it. That's all. Same thing. Jesus said, I can if you believe. Is that right? You've got to to believe. Believe. Not the prayer cards. B, one to a hundred. There's prayer cards B, one to a hundred. Now, how many would share when the boys give out the cards? Let's see it. Now, you know what they did? They bring the cards down, mix them up, so you can have a card. Anybody wants it. You might get number one, the other get number eight, and the other get number 16, the other get 32. You don't know where it's going to be. Therefore, the boy don't know. Don't know nothing about the prayer card. And that day when he comes down, he says, Where's your father going to call from tonight? He doesn't know. I don't know. But we call from wherever the Holy Spirit puts up on me. I used to call little children up and say, Come up, Junior, and count. Where you stop, then, then we'll start from there. Mother would tell Junior where to stop at. <laughs> so it wouldn't, uh, you know, it just don't work. So this way it's sovereign. Where did we start from the other night, brother? We started at one, didn't we? One up, to, yeah, one up to one to fifteen. That we just want to get a few, one person off. Of it. Oh, you don't even have to come up at all. You just have faith. There's more healed out there than there's up here. Anyhow. Let's start from somewhere else tonight. One, two, three, four, five. Let's say let's start from um, four about one to a hundred, just to get started, so we get. Let's start from somewhere else besides one. You give out from one to a hundred. And B. That's prayer card B. Prayer card B. Let's start from 35. That'd be it. 35. 
40, 45, 50. That would be, that'd be 15 there. Prayer card B35. Who has it? Are you sure? Um, pardon? Oh, here, I'm sorry. Come right here, lady. I wonder if you little fellows would move right back in this way, children, if you would, right here. Right back this way around the altar, sweethearts, if you would. You're a mighty fine little children sit there so quiet while I was preaching. B, what was that? 35. B, 35. Are you at 36? Prayer card 36. B, 36. All right, lady. 37. Who has 37? All right, lady. 38. 38. Who has 38? 38, 39. Who has prayer card B, 39? All right, 40. All right, 41. 42. 42. I didn't see it. Uh, maybe somebody deaf and I won't hear. Look around over your neighbor's car. Maybe somebody can't get up. Now, that don't mean to be healed. That, that, it takes your faith in God. I've told you that. Your faith in God. Forty, let's see, where did I start at again? Thirty-six, thirty-six. I started at forty-two. No, I started at thirty-five. Thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two. Forty-two. Not sure somewhere I should be. Forty-two. Be forty-two. Look around your neighbor. Maybe he's deaf now. He can't get up. He don't hear me. Forty-two. Be forty-two. Maybe he stepped out. Forty-three. B forty-three. Over here. Forty-four. Forty-five. Raise your hands and I can see you easy. Forty-five. Way back in the back. All right. Forty-five. Forty-six. Over here. Forty-seven. All right, sir. Forty-eight. Right here. Forty-nine. That's good. All right. Fifty. Way back in the corner. All right. Now, so we want, now we may be able to get to way more than this. I want everybody in here that does not have a prayer card and you're sick to raise up your hand. Does not have a prayer card. All right. All right. Now look. Now while they're gathering them together, give me your attention now. Now don't let anyone get nervous and please don't leave the building. Please, just sit still, real still. Uh, in 15 minutes we'll be out if you'll just keep still, real quiet. You see? When the Holy Spirit, how many have seen the picture of it now? We've got it all over the country, it's all over the world. Hanged in Washington, D.C. A pillar of fire. That George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI, fingerprinting document, taking the photograph and examining it for double exposure and everything. He said the light struck the lens and signed an affidavit to it. He said it's not psychology because the, the mechanical eye of this camera will not take psychology. Now, say that is the same pillar of fire. How many knows that the pillar of fire that followed the children of Israel in the wilderness was Christ? Sure it was, the angel. Well, when he was here, he said, Before Abraham was, I am. Is that right? Well, then, when he was here on earth in a body of flesh, you see what he was? Listen real quiet now, you're missing. You see what he did when he was here? He declared himself to be Messiah. Is that right? We just went through it. Now, he said, a little while, the world won't see him no more, yet you'll see me. I'll be with you. I come from God. I go to God. How many of the scripture says that? Well, then what did he come from that pillar of fire down here and dwelt in flesh and returned back to that pillar of fire? Do you believe that's what he done? While Paul, or Saul, rather, going down to Damascus, was on his road in a great light flash before him and, and knocked him down and... Put his eyes out. Is that right? And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Is that right? When Peter was in prison, what was it come in to the cells and to the bars and opened the doors and took him out? A light. Pillar of fire. Then, if that same pillar of fire that we got, the scientific world knows it's the truth. Mr. Lacey said, he ought to know he's a government man, head of the FBI, the fingerprint and documents of the fingerprints and so forth. He said, there has never been a picture before ever scientifically proven that there's a supernatural being. Now, that's right, it's right on this document. We got it right here. One of them hangs in the Religious Hall of Art at Washington, D.C., the only supernatural being ever photographed. 
Brother Argenbite was with you right here. How many knows Brother Argenbite? A good, honest man. Standing right there. Where was that, brother? In Germany? In Luzon. When they wanted to know if the, that German camera would take it, I said, maybe it will. So when I felt him coming, there's a priest like standing across there. The Holy Spirit began to tell him he was the leader of communists and told him he had stomach trouble and so forth. They began snapping the picture and they got the picture of it coming down when it anointed and when it went back and left. German camera. Well, they've got it everywhere. So the scientific world, if I die tonight, the scientific world knows that is true come from God. The church around the world knows it comes from God because it has the same signs that it did when it was dwelling in our Lord Jesus. And we are sons and daughters of God by adoption through Him. And His Spirit that was in Him is in us. The works that I do shall you do also. Everybody understand real clearly? Now, let me see again. You without prayer cards. That has sickness and diseases, and you want God to heal you. I don't care where you are. Raise up your hand. Well, that's just about everyone. I'll be real reverent. Don't make a bit of noise. Keep real reverent. Just keep real sweet in your soul, and you do this. You say, let me give you a little scripture now. You say, Lord, I'm like the woman that pressed through the crowd. When she seen and recognized she'd had a blood issue, she seen you and she said within herself, if I can touch that man's garment, I'll be made well. You remember the story? And probably she didn't have a prayer card, but she wanted to get through the crowd and she pressed through. So she touched his garment. That was a loose hanging garment. Now the Palestinian robe, he'd have never felt it physically because it was proven. She touched him like that and she went back, sat down. He turned around and said, Who touched me? And the great Saint Peter said, He rebuked him. In other words, you might say, this, What do you mean by saying something like that? Well, that's a, that's a unmental question. Why would you say something like that? Well, everybody's got their arms around you and shaking your hands and saying, Rabbi, we're glad to see you. Well, why would you ask a thing like that? See, that's what people are doing today. He said, But this was a different touch. I perceive that I have gotten weak. Now, if one touch like that would make the Son of God weak, what would it do to me, a sinner saved by grace? Because the translation I gave you a while ago, these things that I do shall you also, and more than this. He is my strength. But it makes you weak. Daniel saw one vision was trouble at his head for many days. Now, he turned around and he looked till he found. Then he told her what her trouble was, and she was healed. Now, to these ministers, I suppose, sitting on the platform, my brethren, and in the audience, how many ministers here tonight has read the scripture that Jesus Christ is right now our high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? How many know that? Right. Well, then, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, he's the same high priest, then he'd have to act the same as he did yesterday if he's the same high priest. Is that right? Because God can't change. Well, now, if you just be, don't, don't get nervous. Don't nobody get up. Just sit still. And you won't be nervous. And we'll just look quietly, saying, Brother Bam and I come touch you. That would be no more good than touching that bench there. Wouldn't do you a bit more good than touching that to touch me. I ain't nothing about me. I'm just a no good sinner saved by the grace of God. Touch your husband. Touch your wife. Touch your brother. Touch somebody else. Be just the same. You're touching man. I don't make any words I put my hands on your knot, but just one time touch him. Yeah. Yeah. Just touch him and let his resurrected life that's among us now see what he'll do. See if he isn't still the same high priest. Brethren, if, he do, if he'll do that, it looks like it ought to take every kink out of your mind, doesn't it? Yeah. It seems like it's so perfect, there's the word that says it. See, now the only thing that keeps me from receiving it is gross denseness. Oh, it's a big I'm so tired. Oh, I, I feel so bad. I wish you could. See, you'll never get nothing. You've got to be on the alert, watching, reverently, watching, bleeding. Lord, this is my hour. I'm coming, Lord. Let me touch you. That man don't know me. How many out there is a stranger to me? Raise up your hand. Knows that I don't know you. How many in a prayer line and I'm a stranger to you and I don't know you? Raise up your hand. Everyone. 
All right, all you are. There isn't one person in here right now that I'm looking at or any word I can see that I know. Not a person. Back here, the only one I know is my own son standing there, Brother Arden back here, the minister here. I'll shut hands with this brother here. My field secretary and one of the managers sitting right here. That's the only people in this building that I know. And if they have anything wrong with them, I won't speak with them. I'll let it go like you got in the room last night back there. I'll let that go till then. But now, now we've, we've talked about it, we've preached about it, declared it by the Word. How many know it says the Word says so? Let's see if... How many says that we believe that Jesus meant just what he said, that that angel would be back on earth to the elected church? Now, my sheep hear my voice. An unbeliever will walk away and shake his head. No, sir. But he wasn't sent to him. He was sent to the believer. Like Abraham, he never went out in Sodom. He went to the elect church, the called out church, the separated church. And he showed them that sign as he was then. Jesus said the same thing would take place. Now, how many believe that that's true? It's time. It's an hour. Now, if he will come and will do something to these people along here, just the same as he did then, out in the audience here and around us, wherever it may be, if he'll do the same thing, how many will promise that with all the faith that I got, I'll accept it? Raise up your hand. Everyone that wants to... I'm trying to find the spot. Now, let's softly sing just a moment. Only believe that your sister will give us the deal. Oh. Oh, I'm being reverent now. Being fair. All things are possible. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I take every soul in here under my control for the glory of God. Don't move around. Be real there. All right. Start your <clears throat> Would you just walk a little closer? Now, to the audience. Now, I've been preaching, so I want to talk to this woman. <clears throat> now, let me scripturally base it now for you. Let's take where I was talking. Let's see be St. John 4. Here's a man and a woman. I believe you held up your hands that we were strangers to one another. We are strangers. So the audience way back in the back would know that we're strangers. We just both to hold our hands up that we don't know each other. Now, this is just like St. John 4. Our Lord come to a well and met a woman. He never saw her. She never saw him. But he described what that woman's condition was, where her trouble was. And quickly she said, you must be a prophet. We know the Messiah is coming, and when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. How many knows that's true? And now, uh, sister, I just got through saying, I believe, that that uh, he was on his road to Jericho, but had to go by Samaria. And the father sent him up there. Well, now, if we don't know one another. I've never seen you, and you've never seen me. And this is our first time meeting. Then, I believe God sent me down here. Brother Arden, right there, called me and asked me if I'd come to Long Beach. And also come to Brother Arnie Vick. I told him I would. Well, they put both weeks down here for some reason. Then I believe that was God doing that. Then I'm here. Then you're here. Father sent me here, but I don't know you. So if the Messiah would happen to me being a man, human being, your brother, Brandon, I don't know nothing about you. God knows that in his word. But if the Messiah will come and anoint me, 
then he'd do the same thing that he did down there. He'd know what your trouble was and could tell you. Now what if if he was standing here himself in person, not me but him? You'd say, Oh Lord Jesus, heal me. Now he couldn't do that. He'd say, Child of mine, I've already done that and I died for it. But then he'd say, That you might know that I am he. I will do as I did when I was here on earth because I cannot change. See? Now, if the Father will show me what your trouble is, then would you believe me to be the Messiah? You'd say, Yea, Lord. And he'd perhaps do the same thing you'd done. Of course, he'd have to. He's, he's the same. But see now, he himself, the body, Jesus Christ, is sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. But he sent back the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was up on him. Now, he had it without measure. The fullness of the Godhead bodily was in him. I just got a little spoonful. That's what we had. Got it by major. But if I took a spoonful of water out of the ocean and brought it up here and tested the chemicals in it, the same chemicals in the entire ocean is in that spoonful. Just not as much of it. See, as I'm talking, I'm watching something. You're aware that something's going on. Now, if the audience can see that, standing between me and that woman stands that light that you're looking at on the picture. There he is. Now it makes me feel good. I know he's here. I was a little weary at first. But he's here now. You're aware that something's going on. I want you to uh, witness to the audience, if it's so or not. Just a moment ago, a real sweet, comfortable, like feeling. It's a nice, comfortable feeling. Try it, isn't it? Now, if the Lord Jesus will let me know something about you, that I know nothing. But if he could tell me something that you have been or something like that, if he could tell you what you have been, he'd know what you will be. If he could tell you that, you'd be the judge for his correct. You are trouble with something with your hip, I believe. Something wrong with your hip. That's what you want me to pray for. If that's right, raise up your hand for the people to see. All right, do you believe now with all your heart? Now, just a moment, see. So that you won't, you'll thoroughly understand it wasn't a guess. But that's as much as Jesus done to the woman at the well. That's right. Is that right? That's right. But now just to let you know that he keeps his word, that proves it. You say, it could have been a guess, Brother Branham. How could I guess that? When right now, I don't know what I told him. It'd have to come off the tape. I'll be rare. Just look again just merely for a vision, that's all. I'm watching you. Yeah, I see you going back, back, back. Yes, it's, it's in your hip. All right, you got a hip trouble. And you've got somebody else on your mind that you're praying for. That's a son. Something wrong with him in a cat. That's right. And then there's something else. That boy is shadowed. That means that he, he needs salvation. He's not a Christian. That's true. You believe God can tell me who you are? Would it help you? Would what? Mrs. Morris? <coughs> Don't believe it. Now, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, just raise up your hands and say, Thank you, Lord Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, Thou hast not left us alone. Thou hast blessed us and given us of Thy goodness. I pray that You will help us to believe now in each one. Be healed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we ask this. Amen. Now please be seated. Please, please. Don't move. Stay still. See, each one of you is a spirit. How many knows that? Sure. Look here. What is this? My finger. What's this? My hand. What's this? My ear. But who's me? It's my me inside. This is what belongs to me. That's what I'm talking about. You. Your spirit. And by being anointed now with his Holy Spirit, I'm in contact with you. Pray. Pray. Don't doubt. What could happen right now if the church would just get alive? Is this the next business? How do you do, lady? Uh, we are strange to each other too, I suppose. I do not know you. But God does know you. And if he knows you, then the only way I'd be able to know you would be by something he'd tell me. Jesus said, I do just as the Father shows me. 
And that's the only way I could do, just as Father would show me. But if he'll show me what your trouble is, will you believe him? The colored lady sitting there, right out here, with high blood pressure. You believe Jesus Christ makes you well now? You touched something, didn't you? Or it's your heel now, Jesus Christ heals you. Now tell me what she touched. Tell me what she touched. She touched the high priest. I don't know that lady, never seen her, but I turned here. I know this was a white woman, and I looked, there's a colored lady standing here. I looked around, she had a little funny looking thing on top of her head. I thought, where's that? I felt like one, like a heartbeat going. I looked, there it was, I see it break loose like that. I seen him put something around her arm and pump it up. And it said, high blood pressure. <clears throat> it's over now, sister. Jesus Christ heals you. And is he a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of iron burgundy? I'd be real reverent now. We want to, God is worship. We like to worship Him, but the Holy Spirit's so timid. Just be real quiet. Now, you little fellows, be real nice down here now in front. Real nice now, real quiet. Everybody, start praying now. Saying, Father, I am needy. While I talk to this woman here, because it's easy to come in contact with her, I don't say you tell her anything. But if he doesn't tell her, if he doesn't say one thing to you, if I just pass you by and lay hands on you, you know, there's got to be some kind of anointing here. Is that right? I wouldn't know these things. Well, then, if you believe it's to be the Holy Spirit, you get your reward. If you call it something else, that'll be between you and God. You see, I wouldn't know. I can only declare the Bible says it. You're just the proof. Now, our sister standing before me, she's suffering with a, a nervous condition and something wrong with her throat. That is right. If that's right, raise up your hand. You believe? Yeah. Just watch me. I believe it'd be better for just taking the time with a few of them like that. Just watch. I think it'll hold the audience better and just start running a big crowd here. I just be real reverent. I feel led to do this. There's something else on her mind. She hasn't she hasn't delivered herself yet. There's something else she has, yes, I see what it is. It's a trouble in your side. It's a growth, isn't it? You believe God can tell me what side it's in? It's in your left side. That's right. Raise up your hand. You believe now? There's something else on your heart. That's a man. That man's your husband. He's sitting out there. You believe God can tell me what's his trouble? Will you believe for him? You put that handkerchief on him? You got trouble with his eyes and with his ears. That's right. Raise up your hand. Go put the handkerchief on him. Be well in the name of Jesus Christ. Have faith now. Have faith. I have whole things becoming like a light all over the building, I see. So now be real reverent. And if I don't get to see you after this for a while, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow night. Now be real reverent, everyone. Now try to help work with me. You realize, if anybody wants to come take my place, you can come right on. See? But just be real reverent. I believe I'm here. I'm not a preacher. I, I, I have the education to be a preacher. God gave me, made me something else, see, so I could help you. Your pastor can preach to you and help you. But he gave me this to help you because I love you and he loves you. And he wants me to express his love to you. How do you do? Now, here's a beautiful picture again. A uh, uh, colored sister and white man. Now, that's the same as it was at Samaria. A Jew and a Samaritan. But Jesus quickly let her know that because it was raised in a different part of the country and turned her skin's different color, God's God of all races. He's just like a flower bed. He has white flowers and red flowers and blue flowers, and that's his bouquet. See, he, he, he makes us this way. But our hearts, we all come from one person, Adam and Eve. That's right. The country we lived in, it changed our colors. It has nothing to do with our spirits and hearts. That's true. God's just as real to you as he is to anybody else. You believe that? You believe me to be his servant. You believe the things I've said. I know you do. I just come from Africa recently, past few years, going back again too. Oh, to see that faith, that simple faith. 
If God will reveal to me what's your trouble, will you believe me to be his prophet or his servant? You'll believe it. May he grant Rectal trouble. The rectal. Now all of you colored people believe now. This is just this. Oh wait, something more than that too. He said it was an intestinal trouble. The intestine. And they're shrinking, shriveling up, flapping these intestines. That is right. You believe with all your heart? You believe you could be his servant? If I tell you what your name is, would you believe me better? Would the audience believe better? Would you believe? Yeah. Miss Jefferson? Go oh, home. Jesus Christ makes you well. God bless you. Have faith in God. How do you do? We're strangers to each other. Tell me when I get free by now. Um, <clears throat> we're strangers to each other. I do not know you. You do not know me. Ma'am, you've been in my meetings, but I would know you. Just sit out in the audience. Something happened, but I missed it. It was in that corner. Maybe it was that lady. The lady had just sat down. Was you the lady just prayed for or something? Yes. I, I watched that light. It left the platform, but I thought it was a man. It is a man. Sitting right there with throat trouble. Yeah. <laughs> the man sitting by you is real happy. Because he just got healed. The glory of God upon him. That man had throat trouble. Your throat troubles left you, sir. Your friend sitting there praying for you brought the power of God upon you. Go now. Your sin's forgiven. Your throat's healed. Go and be made well in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, challenge you. Have faith in God. That lady sitting behind there looking right at me as hard as she can. Don't you see that light standing over She's suffering with a bladder trouble. You believe with her? Raise up, sister. Stand up and accept your healing. All right, go on. Jesus Christ makes you well. i never seen a woman in my life. Are we strangers? One another? Raise up your hand, lady, if that's right. All right. Go home. Be well. When you sit back down, there's a lady sitting right next to you there, bothered with throat trouble also. Stand up, lady, and accept your healing. We're strangers to one another. Go home and be well. Jesus Christ makes you well. Can't you see that he lives? Christ lives. He's the same yesterday and today forever. Just have faith in God, children. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Just believe with all your heart. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. You got a nervous condition. Cough. That's what makes you cough. You're nervous. You're afraid of something wrong in your throat, but it isn't. When you get nervous, that's when you cough more. That's not your main thing, though. You're praying for somebody else. You had an accident, didn't you? Son in the hospital. The semi-conscious. You're scared whether he would die or something. He has been saved, but you're a little afraid. He wasn't afraid of this right. Isn't that right? That's right. Raise your hand. It's all right. It's okay. Go on. You'll come out of it. You believe with all your heart and go down. That's me. You believe me to be his prophet or his servant? That staggers people when they say I don't claim to be his prophet. I'm just his brother. I'm, I'm his servant. Your breath. Just a moment. Just a moment. Something happened. Somewhere in the audience, be reverent now. I'd have to be real reverent and pray now. Just reach up and say, Lord Jesus, I don't care what you have me. Say, that man don't know me. I haven't got no prayer card. I'm not going to be in that prayer line. He don't know me. But Lord, if you just let me touch your garment, then you turn him around to me. See, just see if that isn't right. Just be real reverent. Um, 
We are strange to each other. We do not know each other. But that's right, just so we raise our hands for people see. All right? We are strangers to each other. Then, uh, but God knows us both. Do you believe me to be his servant? The reason I say that, he told me, you've read, probably read my book, have you ever read it? He said, if you get the people to believe you. Believe what? Not believe me to be him, but believe that he sent me. He has to get somebody somewhere. See? So he's got other men on the field, great men, I'm one of the small. But my little part, I like to do for him. To show him my expression about my love for him, to be reverent. I love him with all my heart. And I cannot love him without loving you all. See? For he'd rather I'd love you all than love him. I'd rather you love my children instead of loving me. And me being a parent thinks that. What about him? I say, Brother Bram, what are you doing? I'm waiting to see what he'll tell me. If he doesn't tell me nothing and I just come lay hands on you, would you believe anyhow? Would you believe anyhow? Would the audience believe that way in here? There it comes, though. You've had an operation. Pretty serious. It isn't doing well. You're scared. You're afraid of cancer now. You believe he can tell me what the operation was? I see the operation. There's a gallbladder. I believe. That's right. You're scared. If I don't say nothing what it is or whether it is, if God will just let you have faith, that's all you need, isn't it? Is that right? If he'll tell me who you are or where you're from or something like that or something else in your life, will you believe? Would it make you believe real? You know what? I don't know you. You're not from here. You're from a place called Downey. Right. You're Mrs. Kelly. Right. Now go back to your heel, Jesus Christ. Oh. You believe? Have faith in God. Don't down. That woman, is that the woman just healed or prayed for? That light was right there just a moment ago, right where she was at. Somebody praying. Young man, you have a prayer card? You believe me to be his prophet, his servant? You believe God will heal your friend? If I tell you what's wrong, will you believe it? Cancer. Have faith and believe now. You'll get well. Amen. A lady sitting right back here looking at me. Got trouble with your foot. It was caused from an operation. Wearing glasses, brown hair. You believe with all your heart? Raise up your hand. All right, you can go home and be well. Jesus Christ heals you. You believe, sir? In the name of Jesus Christ, go and be healed. Amen. Have faith now, don't die. Lady, you got something wrong with your eye. If I'll tell you what it is, will you believe? It's cancer. Will you accept your healing? Then in the name of Jesus Christ, go and be healed. Everybody pray. Have faith. My, here's another. Cancer. You believe that God will make you well, sister? Come let me lay hands on you while I'm on you. Go now and may the God of heaven heal you and make you well. That kidney trouble left you while you were sitting there. Go and be made well. Believe on the Lord Jesus with all your heart. Don't doubt. Just believe with all your heart. All right. Come, lady. You believe me to be a servant? God can heal heart trouble. Don't you believe that? You believe yours is healed? And go on your road and say, Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may be well. You had a lady's trouble and also a heart trouble. You believe it's gone? All right. Go on your road and say, Thank you, Lord. Be made well. A man of your age should have a little prostrate nervous trouble. But one of your great things is a killer. That's heart trouble. You believe it he'll heal you? If that's right, raise your hand. Go and be well. Jesus Christ will make you well. I'm believing now. How do you do, lady? You're awful thin, but you got a shadow over you. You're shattered to death. It's a cancer, a killer. You believe God will make you well? 
go and I'll rebuke that devil from my sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may it come out of her. I'm a stranger to you, lady. You believe God can tell me what your trouble is? Would you believe? Wait a minute. Sitting right there with stomach trouble, sir. You believe God makes you well? You believe with all your heart? Black-headed man, young fellow with a white shirt on. Praying there with stomach. That's it. Go home neat now. It's a nervous stomach. Had you blocked off. You believe on me with all your heart? You accept your healing? Stand up if you do. Just raise right up. All right, go home. Jesus Christ makes you well. If God can tell me what's your trouble, you believe me would be his prophet, his servant? Your diabetes will leave you if you believe. Go home, be well. Jesus Christ will heal you. A lady got several things wrong with you. That's right. There's a lady of your age that actually had that. But the thing that you want me to pray for is a heart trouble. That's right. You have a nervous, weak heart. When you lay down, it gets worse than ever. So now, if you'll believe with all your heart, you can go home and be well. Jesus Christ will make you well. How about believing? Sitting there in that salon chair. I can't heal you. Got a prayer card? God can make you well if you believe. You can't sit there and live. Like the lepers that sit at the gate, they say, why sit we here till we die? You got in contact with something. You're in contact with him. Now you touched his garment. If I could just get you to see it, you're dying with cancer. But if you'll believe with all your heart, Jesus Christ will make you well. The leper said, why do we sit here till we die? If we sit here, we'll die. If you sit there, you'll die. Rise up in the name of Jesus Christ. Go home and be made well. And all of us to believe on him. You believe with all your heart? Stand up on your feet, every one of you, and accept your healing. Raise up your hands. Hallelujah. Yes. We're standing up. They're standing up everywhere. Down here, they're getting up. 